Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you all for attending this webinar today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm James Mitra, the founder of JDM. We are an executive search and recruitment firm that partners with high growth disruptive businesses. And um, given what we do at JDM, we are acutely aware that this pandemic has affected many people's jobs. And if any of you are listening are business owners like me or leaders in firms, you will have also had some very challenging days and sleepless nights over the past few weeks. Um, and with the current lockdown we find ourselves in, I think everybody that's listening will have had their lives impacted in different ways. Um, so we've spoken to a number of candidates and clients over the past few weeks, and it's become clear that there is understandably increased levels of anxiety for many as we try and in, in many instances sort of struggle to adapt to this new norm. So with that in mind, we thought it'd be a good idea to set this webinar up uh, to speak to some experts about how we can try to navigate these uncertain times and help protect our mental health. Now we've known uh, our good friends at Blacklight Advisory for many years um, and I couldn't think of two better people than Ajit Menon, a leading organisational psychologist and Trevor Huff, an expert clinical psychologist, to share their insights with you today. Um, so they're going to take the lead on this webinar for the next 20 minutes, after which we'll do a Q&A that I'll facilitate. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to submit uh, further questions during the course of the webinar. And um, thanks to those that have already sent some in. And we will do our very best to answer as many of them as we can in the time that we have. Uh, so I really hope you'll all take a lot from this webinar. Um, and so without further ado, I will hand over to Ajit and Trevor. Thank you very much, James. Hello, everyone. Um, let me give you a brief introduction to Blacklight Advisory as well. Uh, we are specialist consultants and we work with organizations and leaders on strategy, leadership and organizational challenges that they have. Our team is made up of ex expert organizational psychologists and consultants. Um, and we work with organizations across the globe of various sizes and complexity. And my own background is I'm an organizational psychologist and a consultant, and uh, I work with CEOs, leadership teams, and top teams around some of the complex strategic and cultural issues that they have and they face in their organizations. Um, my specialism really is working with leaders to build strong cultures in their businesses and their teams. Trevor? Yeah, thanks, James, and thanks, Ajit, as well. Um, greetings from a cold and rainy Cape Town, where we're in lockdown. Um, yeah, I, I work with uh, Blacklight Advisory. I, um, my training was um, originally as a clinical psychologist and I've worked as a, as a psychologist and therapist for the last 20 years, um, but moved um, into organization consulting as well and I've been working with Blacklight as a consultant. I work with senior leaders, their teams and leadership groups within organizations as well, trying to ensure that organizations perform at their optimal and a lot of that is, is, is working with the emotional health and the mental health of people in those teams as well. So we're here today as James said to talk really about what is happening on a mental health level to all of us through this unprecedented time that we find ourselves in. COVID-19 really has brought about massive uncertainty in the world. Um, you know from day to day we don't know how things are going to change. And we're aware that once when we live in times of uncertainty, what happens is that our anxiety rises. So we're starting to really hear in this webinar to talk about anxiety as the starting point. What is this anxiety we talk about? I mean, we all have an idea in our minds of what anxiety is, but really anxiety is a feeling of fear, of worry, of, un of uneasiness. Anxiety affects us physically, in the sense that you can feel it and you've got sweaty palms, raised pulse rate, kind of stomach complaints sometimes. We feel it emotionally. It affects us emotionally in the sense of fears, dreads, worry, and cognitively. You know, we have difficulty thinking, our memory gets impacted. Those, that, that's what happens when anxiety becomes a little bit of out of control. But the nature of anxiety is that it's a normal part of the human condition, that all of us experience anxiety at some point in our lives in some way. Um, for most of us, we were able to regulate and turn that down. Sometimes it is a bit more difficult to regulate it. But it's part of, our, it's part of our, uh, the, hum, uh, the human condition in the sense that it's a survival mechanism. It's the thing that uh, kind of keeps us aware of what's going on around us and has helped us evolve and keep uh, as a species to keep alive. 
it's not only a bad thing because it also is a form of motivation at the same time so we can you know with too much anxiety we get shut down too little anxiety it becomes problematic at the same time what it does to our brain is that it puts us into a state of either fight flight freeze or fold so when we're in a state of anxiety from an evolutionary perspective what we do is we either fight against it something we run away from something we freeze or we fold into it what anxiety does to our brains is really interesting because as humans we have a part of our brain which no other animal does which is that prefrontal cortex the frontal part of our brain which helps us to think what happens with anxiety when anxiety rises up too much that part of the brain shuts down and we stop thinking and so containing our anxiety and working with it is really important especially when it comes to thinking ajit over to you absolutely i mean i think what trevor said there is really useful it is too much or too little and we kind of call it the goldilocks principle you know too hot too not not too hot or too sweet not sweet so the important thing here is that anxiety is good but it's about how do we manage how do we contain it and in these uncertain times we are all facing different levels of anxiety uh, and that's really how we want to contextualize or set out this webinar for you today which is really thinking about how do we manage anxiety for ourselves for our families and also in organizations for our teams and the people that we work with um we're going to structure it in, in such a way trevor's going to tell you a little bit from a clinical perspective individually what happens to us and then i'll give you some thoughts around what happens in your teams and as leaders what you can be thinking through uh, and then together trevor and i'll give you a few things to consider and we'll then open up to conversation if that's okay so trevor back to you really yeah, thank you so i must say as a, as a as a therapist at the last month i have never been so busy before in my life my days are taken up with speaking to people over video because obviously we can't see them um, in person anymore um and that really does show me the kind of rise in mental health difficulties globally i was speaking to a group of psychiatrists that i work with last week and i think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg of what is about to happen from a mental health perspective going forward we might contain the virus physically but i think the impact on our mental health will be there for years to come and that's something that we're going to have to need to work with and and, and to think about in normal times whatever normal might mean but in times outside of a crisis like we're in right now we know that one in four members of society will be suffering from a mental health difficulty at any point in time it's one in four people under current conditions what we find ourselves in right now is that mental health is going to be very difficult for any of us so all of us are going to find some difficulty going through this this crisis both in the lockdown but i suppose also coming out of it the problem with covid-19 is that there are so many unknowns we don't know what tomorrow brings we don't know what the next week brings we are told here in south africa that you know we're in a lockdown for 21 days however this morning i was in a webinar talking to some people in mauritius who were told that they were coming out of lockdown yesterday only to be told it's been extended by 2 weeks and that in itself brought up huge amounts of anxiety for people so if one in four people are suffering from mental health difficulties on a you know regular time what does it mean for those people going into into in, in, into into this difficulty of covid-19 so any kind of underlying emotional difficulty or mental health difficulty we had will be exacerbated during this time and we're starting to see that people who have anxiety disorders suffer from depression that is well that are well managed are suddenly finding that it's not managed in the same way anymore and so it's been very very aware for ourselves that if we do have underlying difficulties they will be exacerbated at this point in time the other thing i think for it's really important is to think about grief and loss every single one of us have lost something through this process i know that i live in a very privileged position in south africa i have a house i have a roof over my head and i have food and therefore i've lost a lot less than other people out there i still have work however i am losing something be it my freedom of movement be it my ability to socialize my ability to travel i mean the jeet and i here are, we normally together we are kind of at different parts of the world right now we can't be in each other's company um 
we all lose something. And there's something unique to us in the human condition is that when we lose something, the only way we can get through is by grieving. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But grieving is an important part of, 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 of this process of what we're losing. Each of our anxieties are different. They will, they, will, they will manifest in different ways. And I think that's the important part of being aware with our friends, our partners, people we work with, just being aware that our anxiety is not their anxiety. We all deal with it very, very differently. Some it's about loss of work, others the loss of our health, but just being careful of that. The other thing is it's create, this, this virus is creating a lot of paranoia. And that paranoia is coming through through social media, the mainstream media. I mean, I'm on a family WhatsApp group. And I had to, you know, try to ask my mom not to put on all of these threads that are coming through, you know, kind of this fake news that's out there because it, it creates anxiety. And the last thing I want to see is my parents anxious or anybody else that I love anxious. So just being very careful about how that is creating paranoia and stopping us thinking rationally. It's what I would call a flight to catastrophic thinking. And we're needing to find ways of turning down that catastrophic thinking right now and to allow ourselves to think more rationally. And in a sense, that's what we do clinically, is that we help people that we work with, our clients, our patients, to regulate their emotions, to turn down the anxiety so that they can think more rationally through this process. Because this is not the end of the world. The world's not coming to an end. COVID will be, we'll deal with it. Not most, you know, most people, over 90% of people will be okay. Um, we need to be careful, but we don't need to be in a catastrophic thinking state. Ajit. And the, the interesting thing, Trevor, you're talking about from individually, organizations are no different because after all, organizations are made up of people anyway. And what groups and organizations do really well, especially in times of anxiety, uh -huh. high anxiety, is what we call escaping into doing tasks, it's into the doing. And just look, I mean, think about your own circumstances, your own lives. Over the last two weeks, I have kind of noticed for myself how much I have found myself in this cycle of doing, filling every moment of the day with activity and list of things to do. Trevor spoke about these WhatsApp groups. It's been quite interesting. The number of lists of things to do that have been going around the internet or have been forwarded around the place, which has been quite, you know, a way in which we're enabling ourselves to deal with this anxiety. A lot of our clients are reporting that they have never been busier, for example. And the question really is, what are you busy with? We're also finding many people are exhausted trying to juggle the different roles. One of the most interesting things this thing has done for all of us is it has annihilated our boundaries. It has taken away the boundary between our personal life and our professional life in various different ways. In terms of time, for example, it's difficult for us to manage the different timings that we have because we are all kind of juggling the time of work, time of our personal spaces. For those of us who are also have children and now are in the position of homeschooling, it's also annihilated our boundary of role because we've also taken on a new role of becoming teacher. So we are parent, we're teacher, we're professional, we're partner, there's all these things happening at the same time. For many of us who have or don't have the ability to move in different spaces, that's also gone away. We don't have a professional space and a personal space. Quite a few of us are working off our dining tables. This entire blurring of boundaries is also quite anxiety provoking because it's, it causes us, uh, it, it's difficult for us to be able to separate. And what a lot of people are doing is trying to put in a lot of structure, which is a good thing to do. However, when the structure becomes persecutory in that you have a long list of things to do, you have a structure, it just causes you to heighten your anxiety. Another really interesting thing that we're noticing in this thing of trying to be parent and teacher and professional, for example, is a lot of people, especially people I speak to, are trying to do it in the perfect way. So somewhere in us, our be perfect script gets activated. I've got to be able to be the, right, the best boss possible, the best partner, the best teacher and the best parent. That also puts a huge amount of pressure on us in a situation that is so unprecedented. This thing of trying to do everything because what the doing is doing is it's taking us away from the stepping back from it and reflecting on the anxiety that we are actually facing. It's enabling us to defend against that anxiety. And what we're doing inadvertently is putting a lot of pressure on ourselves, on the people around us and on our teams as well. So the important thing here is the focus of, on task 
takes away from us focusing on relationship and in the relating with each other. And that's something I think that's quite important. Um, and maybe Trevor, we can talk a little bit about how we can think about that in teams um, and for us in terms of teams and groups and what happens there. What we don't want to do through this is to then again, give you another long list of things to do. So, which just defeats the purpose of what we're saying. But Trevor and I are gonna give you four principles or four concepts just to hold in mind in order to make you more aware of what's happening around. Yeah, thanks, Ajit. I think it's really important. And this is not just for teams at work, but I suppose your families, your friends. The first one we're gonna talk about is containment. And what do I mean by containment? Well, this morning I get up to make coffee. I turn on the tap and the water flows out and I use something to hold the water, the container, right? my coffee maker. And in the same way we work as human beings in relationships, in families that we all need containment. Our emotions need containment. And the way we do that for other people is to be there to ask, to um, kind of listen, to kind of reflect back what they're feeling by just attending to people's emotions, being there for their emotions. We actually help contain those emotions by containing them. We turn down the volume of them. And by turning down the volume, we allow people to think more rationally and to be motivated and to carry on. However, when we are doing containing all the time, we also need people to contain us. Otherwise, we wear up. In fact, Ajit and I were just having a conversation before this webinar started. And he was talking about how exhausted he feels through what's been happening in the last couple of weeks. And saying to him, well, it's not surprising because you're spending most of your day containing people through your work. Who's there containing you when you're able to contain your child at the end of the day? And so I think for all of us being I suppose asking the question, who contains the container? Who's there to help us turn down that volume so that we can look after people in the same way? Remember that frontal cortex of the brain, the part of, that allows us to think and to be present, has a time span of about 50 minutes before it wears out. We're not able to kind of go outside, take a walk, you know, take the normal breaks that we, that we normally do. And so we get, we get exhausted a lot quicker and therefore, are less able to contain. Najid? Linking with that is the idea of psychological safety. And I think psychological safety sits both in teams, in our organizations, but also in families. That is, um, how can we create an environment that is psychologically safe for people to be able to express their anxieties? A client of mine said to me that she has a regular Tuesday catch up with her team. And someone called on the Monday night and said, do you mind if we don't have the regular catch up? I'm just really overwhelmed. That's a really nice example when your teams can say to you, I can't do this, I'm really anxious, or I'm not able to get on with this. Creating that psychological safety allows people to put their hands up and say, stop. They're able to trust you, but they're also able to be vulnerable with you. See, what happens quite a lot in groups and teams also is that we are looking around um, to see, and we are also quite anxious about how will I be perceived? If I, see, if I say something, how will I be perceived? Will people think I'm weak? Will people think I can't deal with this? Actually, no. In a time that is so unprecedented, where anxiety is so high, it's important upon us, especially for leaders, to create that space where losing face is not an issue. Rather, going back to what Trevor's saying, the space can contain the anxiety. I think that's really the important thing, which is we are so many people are raw and vulnerable, and it's okay to be that way because that's how that's what the situation has presented for us. So as leaders, we all have big roles to play in our organizations to really get in touch with and be aware of the level of anxiety that's there in the teams, invite people to share, invite people to speak up, invite people to embrace and learn from these failures and mistakes. It kind of goes both ways. You create the, the space for people to do that. And then you also are able to enable them to contain what's going on for them. Be curious, ask questions, and really be in touch with what's going on for your team. So our team, for example, is spread all over the world. We have a colleague in South Korea, Trevor's in Cape Town. We have a colleague in Wales. We're all over the world. And it's really important that we've been able to now make sure that we have a regular connection with everyone so people are able to be in that safe space as a team. Trev? Yeah, I mean, I think what you touch on is so important. You know, we, we're all worried and anxious about do we get the virus? Do our loved ones get the virus? What, you know, kind of how that plays out, but also economically in terms of our jobs. You know, what happens 
to, to, to work, to companies that we work in. And that's, that's a big concern for many people. I mean, and that's where I suppose creating a, a team or a space of psychological safety um, is really important. I mean, we had as a team the other day, an amazing space, all of us all over the world in a webinar, just to create a reflective space that we were able to talk about what we feared about our organization, you know, what would happen to black life moving forward. And the amazing part of that is just by talking about those fears and creating a safe space or a psychologically safe space to do that, we were able to kind of to discharge those feelings and then kind of look at look forward and say, wow, okay, cool. What do we do to ensure that we really thrive and survive through this process? What we need in that space is what I would call a secure base. Now, secure bases can both be a leadership process, but it's also a parental process. What if what does it mean to be a secure base for people? Well, take it back to our childhood. A secure base parent was somebody who was consistently available, who was able to listen, to understand, but to also put down boundaries and to and to motivate and push a child forward. And we would say that a, a secure attachment parent is one that is has open arms and allows the child to come in, but also pushes them out to go and explore with a belief that they can go out there and do that. Secure-based leadership in this time is even more important. We know that secure-based leaders are ones that trust their team, believe that the people who work with them can succeed. The opposite to that are what we would say avoidant or dismissive leadership styles or attachment styles. And those are the people that just don't want to talk about feelings, just push you up, get on with your job. And that paradoxically creates more anxiety in the team. We also know that leaders that are anxious can tend to become a little bit more micromanaging, checking up every single step, you know, a bit of the day and seeing what people are up to. And that also doesn't help. So secure base is really a place where somebody's available to listen, to hear, to be consistently there, but also to motivate and push people out. Now, we've all got to find our own secure bases. We cannot be a secure base for anybody unless we have a secure base of our own. That secure base can be a person, but we also know that it can come through other things. A hobby. I mean, you know, I have an indoor bicycle and I'm spending a lot of my time on that. And paradoxically, that space of just cycling for an hour in the evening is a secure base for me. For other people, it might be spiritual, whatever your spiritual beliefs are. Having a secure spiritual base is a place where we recharge and somewhere we can turn. But we all need those secure bases. Ajit? And I think to, to end on this, so just to, to, to quickly recap, we spoke about the idea of containment, containing the anxiety, or creating an environment that's psychologically safe. Trevor spoke about the secure base. And so for the very last thing, and we already alluded to this, is that creating that reflective space. There's a story I heard, and I don't know if it's a true story, it's an internet meme I've got confused with, or it was a myth that went around. So um, if, if I stand to be corrected, and I, I'm very, very happy to be corrected on this, but the story I remember being told was the famous psychoanalyst Carl Jung um, had a client that came and said to him, Dr. Jung, I'm really anxious. I need to speak to you on Thursday at 10 o'clock at our uh, session. And Dr. Jung said, no, we don't have a session at Thursday at 10 o'clock and I can't meet you because I'm really busy. And so the client was quite disappointed. He went away <clears throat> Thursday, 10 o'clock. The client was on his yacht in Geneva on the lake. And who does he see there by the side of the lake but the good doctor with his trousers rolled up, his feet in the water basking in the sun. So the client gets really angry and goes back to Dr. Jung and says, I really needed you. I was very anxious. You were not there for me on the Thursday. And you said you had an important meeting, but you were not there. I saw you at the side of the lake. And Jung apparently says to him, it was the most important meeting of the week for me, the meeting I have with myself. And what I mean by this is for us to be able to create that space for reflection, to move away from doing, 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 doing all the time and giving us that space to be able to still ourselves at a time of high anxiety is really, really important. And it's not just for us, but also for our teams and the reflective space is even more important also in families to have a conversation about what does this mean for us? What is going on for us around here and how are people coping with it? not what are people doing. So I guess that's really the story, James. That's, that's what we wanted to present, a little bit about anxiety and then a few things for our listeners to think about. Over to you.
Thank you very much uh, to you both. That was, that was really fascinating and, and, and I'm sure everyone listening will have taken a lot from that. We've had some great questions that have come through. Um, so perhaps I'll start with, with one from Hannah. Thanks to Hannah for this. Um, she asked, and I guess this is probably uh, sort of for, for, for Trev first, given that you alluded to this, but can you talk a little bit more about grief during this period um, and how that, how that may play out? I mean, it's a really interesting question. And I think that understanding how humans deal with loss is really important. There's a wonderful um, writer by the name of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who wrote um, about death and dying, and she talked about the grieving process. But what we know is that any kind of loss for humans is the only way we get over it is to kind of grieve it, you know, whatever that loss is. And we know that we go through different stages through that process of loss loss. They're not always, they don't always happen in a linear way and one, you know, one to the next, but it's important to understand those. And really the first one um, that she talks about is shock. And I think in many ways we've, we've experienced that in the world, shock at what's happened with COVID. Like, my gosh, you know, what's happening? She said then we can go into a state of denial, like this is not going to happen to me. It's going to, you know, it's only in China or it's only in Italy. And then one day it hits us. We can have an experience of anger, which is quite normal. The, the, the anger at losing, you know, kind of my, my ability to travel, my ability to see my friends, my ability to, to, have, to have work. And it's a normal process in the grieving cycle to go through anger. Sadness, depression, to feel that sense of, 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 of sadness that comes through it. And it's through these different phases and understanding that they're normal things for us to go through that we get through to the other side. And getting through to the other side is the ability to then calm down the emotions and think about, okay, well, this is the new normal until next time or until the next thing comes along. And I can see the opportunities that come from this because there are opportunities that have come from this. We don't have to be victims. We, you know, we can, we can be resilient in this process and I'm seeing amazing resilience come out of people. But that's a big thing for me around the grieving cycle, which is accepting that we go through it it's, we don't, it's like taxes, the grieving cycle is one thing we don't escape. Um, and recognizing where we are in that cycle. Thank you, yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Um, I think as a parent myself, is a great question that's coming from Rachel, um, who, who asked, do you have any tips on how to explain this situation to our children um, and, and how to help them navigate uh, through this time? So I don't know which one of you would like to take that, but. Uh, think it's a really probably one that a lot of people listening to would, would value your opinion on i can i can tell you from experience i mean of course it has to be done age appropriately and only you as a parent can decide how appropriate the age is for your child um but i think that one of the, from my experience is telling them untruths or that the fairies are doing things doesn't really help children understand children are hearing what's going on around them from a very young age my child's only six years old and, and they know things are happening around them. They can hear the news, they're seeing things going on. So I think in an age appropriate way, having a conversation with them around how are they feeling about what they're hearing is a very, very securing thing to do for them. It is creating the psychological safety that they can ask you a question and they will get told what really is going on. That, that's, my, that's my belief from it. Um, you know, Making up stories or telling them that children pick up on this very, very quickly. And it probably then heightens the anxiety even more for them because they know all is not right. So, you know, we had, we had a conversation about what does this mean? What happens? What is COVID? We've had a conversation about that, of course, in an age appropriate way, so as to not frighten him, but at the same time for him to have that understanding of what is there. Trevor, would you say anything else? I completely agree with you on that. I mean, I don't speak from, the, from being a parent, but I, but I, some really interesting research that a friend of mine did some years ago, where they were looking, we were looking at recovery times of children after surgery, and they decided to research children having tonsillectomies, and they needed to cut down bed, bedtime. So what they did is they looked at what doctors were telling children as they were going into surgery or before. And what they found is that many of the doctors at the time were telling kids that, oh, you'll feel this little prick in your, in your arm, you'll go into a nice little dream world and you'll come out and everything will be wonderful and you'll feel great. And they realized that this wasn't the reality. And so what they did is they split it up into to two groups. They took one kid, a lot of children, they told the same story to, and they took another group where the doctors actually took the child through the 
the actual operation in an age appropriate way and explain exactly what would happen. And they wouldn't wake up feeling wonderful. They'd have a sore throat, there'd be blood and all that. And then they compared the recovery times. And it was amazing, the statistical um, significance um, that, 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 that came out in terms of the recovery time of children they told the truth to. And so I, I truly believe that is the most important thing. Don't make up stories. Yeah, that's 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 really helpful. Thank, thanks to you both. Um, I think probably another another thing that's impacting a lot of us at the moment is is having loved ones that work in the health service or on the front line. Um, Jeff sent a, a great question asking, "What coping strategies would you recommend for frontline healthcare workers at the moment?" So it's so interesting that um, they've done the, 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 the Department of Psychology. I think it was Beijing University. Um, released a paper into the Lancet, which is a medical journal last week, and said, what is psychologically healthy and important for healthcare workers? And what they found is, if you think about it, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, the kind of you know, therapy stuff is really about self-actualization, but we've gone right to the basic end of that, of that, that, that hierarchy. We're at safety, security, you know, whatever else. And, and in many ways, what healthcare workers are requiring right now more than somebody to, you know, just to ask how they're feeling, which is an important part, but taking care of things for them, like making them a meal, creating a space where they feel, you know, kind of like they're taken care of on a, on a physical level, they get nurturance in that. Um, so I think, you know, not thinking high level all the time, but actually thinking in a very basic level, you know, there are uh, people taking food to healthcare workers. I think those are the things that, that are really important. Um, creating a space where they have some time off. I mean, in some of these Chinese hospitals, what they were doing was creating sleeping quarters, but really beautiful sleeping quarters where they worked shifts that they gave people just a period of time that they could, they could rest because people are absolutely exhausted. So it's, it's, it's not highfalutin ideas of kind of therapy that is often necessary in these cases, but something quite basic. James, can I just point out something? Because I'm also noticing some of the questions coming through and quite a lot of the questions are, what are the five things we can do? What are the strategies? What are the things? And I think what Trevor and I are urging you all to think about is don't add on another list of things to do. It will then, what will end up happening is we'll find ourselves in a position where there's yet another list of things we didn't get to, which increases the anxiety more. Um, so I'm just urging you to consider thinking about that. Whilst we can give you lots of different strategies, if it just compounds the anxiety for yourself, for your families and your teams, it defeats the purpose as well. Thank, thank you, Ajit. Um, uh, there's one, uh, the, the, well, there's, there's a few, I think we'll maybe move to talking a little bit from a, a team perspective, um, something I'm particularly um, interested in, given that I have a small team and uh, keen to kind of navigate this uncertainty and, uh, you know, get your thoughts on this. Um, Chris has asked, as a leader, um, what can I do to help my team uh, go from being a sort of, I guess, a face-to-face uh, sort of being the norm through to a, a, a now virtual situation. How can you help the team in that in that transition? Um, so one of the things I think is connection. If you have been a face-to-face -face sitting next to each other all the time kind of team, you've had a different kind of connection and a different kind of relationship to where you are right now. So that's going to be something to consider in terms of the, the texture of the relationship would have changed. And so how do you kind of keep, make sure that you can keep that going is going to be something that's quite important through this process. I would say, again, as we were talking about earlier on, is keeping, creating more regular interaction virtually, not just on task. So not just regular interaction around here's what you're doing, who's doing what. But outside of that, making sure you can have regular team interaction around the relationship. How are people feeling? What's going on? What was your weekend like? How are people coping with, um, I don't know, the lack of being able to go out on a Friday night? Or I know lots of teams are doing things like team drinks in the evening, or people are doing things like virtual lunches. The big thing that's got lost from us moving from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual is that relationship has changed. It's not got lost, it's changed. So that's something quite important, I think, in terms of thinking about it. Secondly, I think what might be also helpful is to create some kind of ritual around this. So you have your Friday morning team call that is ritualistic. So people have that structure in their mind, they have that boundary, and they're able to come to that regularly on a basis. That also helps them at some level to keep that going. And then lastly, I think is connect with your people, both again, individually. I would say ensure that you are connected to them 
so that they know that you're there and you are that secure base that they need that Trevor spoke about. Trevor, would you add anything else? No, I think you've, I, th I think you've covered it. I think the big thing in, in that, and I'm, I'm seeing with a lot of teams, is that out of the goodness of people's hearts and of wanting to be helpful, um, people are setting up so many of these face-to-face -face meetings, so many of these coffee meetings, so many of the playing the next song meeting, that we have to be careful also that it doesn't itself become overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. So just, just being able to like, if, if, you know, how many meetings have we got? I mean, you know, I, I, I sometimes find I'll start in, in, on, on video calls at seven o'clock in the morning and at 10 o'clock at night, I'm, I'm going, oh my gosh, I think I had, I think I had breakfast at four. Um, it's too much. And therefore just another well, you know, kind of well-meaning meeting can, can itself be overwhelming. So I think for leaders to kind of just kind of get a sense in their teams, like, you know, kind of, you know, are we doing too much? Um, you know, are these meetings kind of helpful or are they not being helpful? That's a really important thing to ask as well. Thank you. Um, Clarissa has asked, I think Ajita alluded to it in, in his intro, um, but what, what are the defining elements of a strong culture, in your opinion, which I guess in these times is, is particularly important um, to, to, you know, you, I'd, I'd like to think JBM has a strong culture, but it'd be great to understand your thoughts on that. Can I turn that around, James, and be very naughty there and say, what makes JBM's culture a strong culture? Ooh, put, putting me on the spot. Um, I think it, you alluded to it. I'd like to think we have a, a situation, uh, everyone in the business feels that they have their own voice and has a say and an opportunity to express themselves. So we've always pride ourselves on it being a, a feeling like a family. And we've always wanted people who weren't necessarily typical recruiters and um, that could come in and be bring the best version of themselves every day to work. Um, so I think it's that support network. It's um, it's bringing different opinions to the table and 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 and, and having a non-judgmental um, organisation, but also one where we can have fun. You know, we can be have a hopefully a high achieving culture too. That's probably what what I'd say. Having not had any time to think that through, but <laughs> that's probably from my perspective what makes our culture uh, strong. Yeah, I mean, what, what you've alluded to there again. If I go back to what we're talking about around safety, psychological safety, there's been a lot of work to show that teams that feel psychologically safe, where the culture is strong, has a direct impact on how they perform together. Where trust is high, people are able to therefore perform well together. I'm able to be vulnerable with you, therefore we can I'll go into battle with you. Those are things that really make a culture strong, where people want to work in the organization because of that, around the safety they feel around working with individuals elsewhere, and also leadership's role in building that culture. Leaders are incredibly important in the way in which they role model and, and what they do, people are watching this. And the way in which leaders show up in organizations has a really important impact in terms of building the, those different aspects and elements of the culture. Great, thank you. Um, Can I just add one thing? Sorry, James, I think what you touched on, you described your culture so beautifully. Oh. The things that you value and the things that are important that makes your organization what it is. And perhaps during this time, the most important thing is creatively thinking about how do you hold on to that culture through a difficult time? What are the things that you most value and, and how do you make sure that those are kept alive? Uh, that's great advice. No, thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of time, but we still do have some, some, some great questions coming through. So we'll, we'll try and get through them. Um, somebody's messaged um, to say that, that their partner has lost his work over the, the past few months. Um, and is struggling to see, uh, sort of can see no way to move forward and is closing down emotionally and mentally. And um, do you have any advice for, for, for that person, uh, how she can support her, her partner and just generally some, some pointers that could help him? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, first of all, I'm really, really sorry to hear that. And it's, it's something that I think is unfortunately gonna become all the more common as, as we move through this crisis. Um, Understanding, I suppose, with your partner about, you know, they are going through a grieving process. Where are they in that grieving process? Perhaps also respecting that sometimes at first <clears throat> they're trying to make sense of it. I, I, have a, I have a situation with two colleagues of mine um, in an organization that I work with who, based in London, lost parents in South Africa last week. They are stuck in London, cannot come back, and they will not be able to go to the funeral of, of, of their parent. They 
you know, are obviously in a state of grief. And what they've, what they've said is up front, they can't talk right now. They can't even find words to describe what it's like. And so my responsibility is to kind of respect that, create the space, let them have a bit of time to make sense of it, and then come back in. Um, if we see our partners or people that we love for an extended period of time unable to process their feelings, then I think we do have a duty of care to perhaps reach out to somebody who might be able to help them. But just allowing them to understand that we're there, we're not going to pressurize them, and when they're ready to open up, we, we're available, I think is a really, really good first step. Yeah, great. And I think everyone probably listening will, will echo your sentiments there. It's, it's, it's horrible to hear things like that. And I know, uh, I, hope, I hope that this webinar can be helpful for, for anyone that's suffering in that respect. Um, we've got probably two more two more questions, guys, if you don't mind. Um, and Christian has, has messaged to say, um, I suspect one of the things that stops us from making space for ourselves is a sense of guilt, that we are not being effective or productive enough to justify this time out. So are there any techniques you would recommend to override this instinct to keep busy and, and thus allow us to take a step back um, despite all the other burning priorities? So um, I'll, I'll give you one view um, and Trevor might have another one, which is interesting is that, you know, the big part of the modern narrative is if I'm busy, then I'm important. And we kind of end up in this busyness cycle quite a lot. There has been some research done on this, which is very interesting and it's called action addiction. So what happens in addiction, addictive behavior? You, uh, dopamine is the key player here. In your brain, you, it's a highly addictive substance and then you get a reward. You get this hit, this rush when you finish an action list. The dopamine hit kind of helps you. And then you get addicted to doing tasks so that you kind of find yourself in that because it's a sense of short-term pleasure and gratification. And I kind of end up doing this over and over again. So you find yourself in the action addiction, the cycle of it. I don't know how many of you remember when we had Blackberries back in the day and the red light used to go off on the Blackberry in the middle of the night. I used to still wake up because I knew an email had come through. You get addicted to the action and to take it off. Uh, if we're only chasing short term wins, what ends up happening is it just keeps ourselves busy over and over again. You don't, you're not able to sit back and see the bigger picture. And that's why what we're saying is that the important thing is a becoming aware of what, the fact that you're doing that awareness is the biggest part of this whole thing. The minute you are aware and you're consciously aware of the fact that you're keeping yourself busy and you're in this cycle. And that's an important thing. Another interesting thing that you use in your statement is effective or productive enough to justify this time out. You're not taking time out. This is an unprecedented situation we're in where we're all forced to take the time out, which is another important thing for us because it has been forced upon us. So who are we justifying this to? Is it ourselves? I think that's a big question to ask as well. So watch out for action addiction because it keeps us occupied. It's a kind of modern laziness where you're, you know, you're constantly doing things in order for us not to be able to get in touch with what is really going on and what circumstance do we presently find ourselves in. I think that's what I would say. Trevor, would you add anything else? I mean, I would only talk to the process of guilt. And I think that um, it's an important thing to, to, for us to talk about because we talk about survivor guilt. But I think that, you know, many of us have guilt in this situation. Guilt that I have a job, guilt that I have food, guilt that I have a house, guilt that many, many different, you know, processes of guilt that are going to play out. But also, in a sense, our own personal kind of response to, to that, and our own, you know, kind of that, that, that voice that we internalize, the critical parent that sits inside our head saying, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. I think at this point in time, one of the things we really need to do is to learn to be kind to ourselves. Um, to kind of give ourselves a bit of a break as well. And that's not saying that we don't have to, you know, kind of be aware of what's happening around us. But by berating ourselves and beating ourselves down, we are not helping anybody not just ourselves but we're not helping those that we need to be there for at the same time thank you guys and um, last question um uh, is, is from denise um and we and we alluded to i think earlier around there's been some incredible examples of resilience i thinking of all the um all of the the, the healthcare workers as an example and those that are supporting keeping the our countries going um but she asked, what are your tips for helping to build resilience? So if you're not 
you don't necessarily see yourself perhaps as a resilient person or you just you know given the unprecedented times you know how, how what can we all do to, to build some some more resilience so think about that i mean it's, an, it's such an interesting question i'm gonna kind of i'm a south african so i'll use a sporting analogy um which we tend to do a lot of you're running a marathon you're training for a marathon how do you get fit how does your body become resilient enough to manage a marathon and it doesn't happen by going out and running 40 k's the first day um, there's some idiots like myself who might try and do that but on the whole we do it bit by bit and it takes some training and then it takes some rest it takes some training and it takes some rest and i think it's exactly the same with emotional resilience it's about understanding that the only way we can be resilient is by creating space for ourselves by having a bit of fun at the same time as working hard um, we also understand that children build up resilience by having a safe space to turn to. In other words, by being able to be vulnerable. Paradoxically, is the very thing that creates resilience over time. It's not the fact that I'm not vulnerable. You know, the idea that we should be like John Wayne, or we, you know, if we're not John Wayne, we're Woody Allen. Neither of those are appropriate. That real human beings, all of us. Uh, you know, have vulnerabilities. And, it, and the important part is that if we acknowledge those vulnerabilities and have a space of, to let out those vulnerabilities, paradoxically, we become stronger. Strength really is the Gandhis, the Mandelas of the world, not the, you know, kind of autocratic leaders that we see out there. They're real human beings with real emotions. And I think by acknowledging those emotions, we really do build resilience, especially in a time like this. If anybody's not scared, not afraid or not anxious right now, I'm slightly worried about, you know, who they are and perhaps they need more help than the others. And often, Trevor, just to add that often leaders also feel that they need to be infallible and have all the answers, which is where it becomes really difficult because you then end up putting a lot more pressure on yourself. It's okay not to know. It's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to make a mistake, especially in something that we don't know we've never been through before, at least in our generation and lifetime. I think that's a really uh, great place to to end this, uh, Ajit and Trevor. Thank you both very much for your your insights today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure everyone listening will have taken a huge amount from that. Um, and I think on behalf of uh, everyone at JBM, uh, we sort of send our best wishes to everyone at this time. And um, we are here to help as well in any way that we possibly can. So do feel free to reach out if we can support you. Um, but thanks again to you both. Uh, it was absolutely fascinating. Um, and yeah, look forward to catching up with everyone again soon. Thank you for having us, James. And thank you, everyone else as well. Yeah, thank you so much for the time. Thank you, James. Really appreciate it. And Ajit, always great to work with you. All the best. Thanks, thanks. Take care.